So without any further ado, I would like to introduce, introduce our keynote speaker, Gail Olson, Professor Emeritus, Nursing, Winona State University in partnership with the Community Pathways to Family Health and Recovery. This presentation will describe how a conversation between two concerned professionals evolved into a nonprofit corporation composed of community members, university faculty, dedicated to addressing gaps in service for families impacted by adversity with special focus on substance use. Community members bring knowledge and wisdom from their lived experiences, while faculty bring scholarly expertise and scientific rigor. Both groups bring unique and crucial perspective to the exploration of issues and the development and evaluation of resources and services. The mission of the organization is to create sustainable community pathways to family health and recovery by cultivating dynamic partnerships, conducting relevant research, developing and evaluating resources, and advocating for data-driven policies and education. So please welcome Gail Olson and launching a collaboration project that established scholarship. Thank you. Yeah, I'll thank give you just, yeah, just a moment and we'll get um, okay. to your slide. Okay. While we're doing that, I'll introduce myself a little bit further. Um, I um, am a um, pediatric nurse practitioner and have practiced with children and families um, for many years. Actually, I graduated from uh, college uh, good 51 years next month. And um, with one exception, uh, scheduling error, I had to take care of an adult once and he weighed 600 pounds, which affirmed my decision that I really like working with kids. And that's um, been my focus throughout my career, um, working with families with children. And I have um, most recently worked at the Alternative Learning Center where we had a free clinic working with adolescents. And, um, and then, uh, and now I'm involved with this uh, collaborative project. We could go to the next slide. Do I need to do that, Robin, or do you do that? Can I do that? You do it. Okay, good. All right, thanks. Um, so the objectives for today are to describe how a small community academic work group evolved to uh, have a nonprofit corporation, and then to discuss the benefits, challenges, and potential for creative solutions when community members and academicians come together to address community concerns. Next slide. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, we skipped a slide, but that's okay. Um, we don't need, oh, there we go, okay. And um, while I was working at the Alternative Clinic, uh, Alternative Learning Center Free Clinic with adolescents, it, I, I realized how many of those kids that we saw on a daily basis uh, were raised in families that were affected by addiction. Parents, siblings, most commonly parents. A lot of the children have been in foster care uh, because of parental addiction. And, um, and it was aware of the impact that that had on these kids. And once they got to the Alternative Learning Center, there were two full-time counselors available, the Zumbo Valley Mental Health and Rochester Schools have done a really good job of getting counseling into the school system. There were two full-time counselors at the uh, Alternative Learning Center. But prior to that, many of these kids hadn't had an opportunity to um, get uh, support services and had kind of been on their own in these families. And um, so that was part, part of why I became interested in this area. I also come from a family that has uh, uh, family members who have been affected by alcoholism. And so I have been at uh, treatment facilities for family days at Hazleton and a variety of treatment centers, Mayo. And so I've been at a number of family days and um, as well as continuing at conferences on addiction. And almost always the focus is on the person who struggles with addiction, the person who has substance use disorder, and children are rarely mentioned. And I thought that was kind of so. I had a conversation with Mitch uh, Moore, Dr. Moore, who's in the room, I think, and who is in the counseling education department here, and he heads up the licensed alcohol and drug counseling program. And so I shared my observation with Mitch. You know, it seems like there's a lot of services for the uh, people with addiction, but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of services for children or even awareness of children. What do you teach about that in your program? And Mitch was kind of, well, I don't know, um, not a lot. Well, you know, I said, well, why not? Because children are so impacted by this. And um, that led to uh, further conversations. And I can go, we can go to the next slide. 
and uh, other people joined our conversation, uh, faculty members who were interested in this and concerned about the negative impact on children. And we got together and we, after a few meetings, we formalized our membership and we uh, decided to adopt a community-based participative research approach um, to this issue. And community-based participative research is a really powerful research uh, method that allows a broad range of stakeholders to participate. And as a group, we decided we would use this model to determine, do we have a problem? Is it a significant problem? Are there gaps in services for children as we had suspected? And uh, the research method would give us an opportunity to develop and evaluate evidence-based interventions when we got to that point. Next slide. Um, Community-based participative research is um, um, brings together community members along with people, academic researchers, and you become really equal partners. And it capitalizes on the unique strengths that both bring. Uh, the people, the academic researchers uh, bring uh, the ability to search the literature, the ability to evaluate evidence, the ability to design research projects, the ability to analyze data, and, um, so they, and some scientific rigor. And the community brings really a remarkable degree of insight, experience, and wisdom that if you're not in the community, you oftentimes aren't aware of. And so this is a, a method to bring, bring the strengths of both groups together. The research questions arise from the community, um, and then the research results go right back to the community who are able to use that to address the problem that's being uh, looked at. Um, it's kind of different. I was raised, I didn't like academic uh, community-based participatory research at first because I thought randomized controlled, uh, randomized controlled trials were the gold standard and where you, de you design your question and you narrow it down, you control all your variables, you have an elegant methodology and then when you're done you disseminate your results, you publish your parish basically. And this is such a different process, right? Because it starts with the community who raises the issue the community decides what are the questions we want to answer, how's the best way to answer those questions, and you combine those two perspectives, and it's a very powerful model. If we can go to the next slide. Okay, um, some of the advantages, it takes place under real world conditions. Um, the questions that are posed are relevant to the community. Um, it helps recruit uh, subjects from the community. Uh, sometimes communities aren't very trustful of uh, ac academic types who come in and want them for subjects. And this uh, helps the community um, um, give input about what are the risks, what, what are our uh, hesitations about this, and uh, what are the appropriate protections that they would like to have. Uh, you get better instrument design, and we found this when we did our first research project. Some of our community members had ideas about what terms we should use and what questions would be important to ask. And the, the uh, second to the last bullet there, communities are really helpful sometimes in interpreting results, uh, especially un unexpected results. And I'm gonna take a little detour here for a second um, to illustrate that point. Years ago, I worked in a uh, federal health um, healthcare project uh, for children in, on the Delta in Mississippi. It's an extremely poor area, really subsistence living. And um, we, it had that, the county that we worked in had the highest infant mortality rate in the country. And uh, so very high risk. Most of our moms were young black women, young black girls. I wouldn't even call them women yet. Uh, some of, I think our youngest mom was 12. And um, we rarely saw uh, uh, moms over 18. So we had this particular population. And um, we, we were concerned about a dis discipline problems, the way they disciplined. They, they would, um, when the kids got to be about 15, 18 months, they would cut a willow switch off a tree and they would start kind of switching their kids uh, as a discipline technique. And we knew that there were better ways because we knew a lot because we were the experts. I was also teaching at the university and we knew there was a better way to discipline. And so I designed uh, really a nice intervention to teach discipline to these moms. And it was really very good at in including rehearsal and practicing and all kinds of elements to it that was really good and it totally failed and so it was like wow okay that's not good so I went back and we you know we revised some of it and I got input from my other academic colleagues social work psychology pediatrics um, early education a group of us and they helped me refine the tool and we thought again we thought this is okay this is going to work this time absolutely failed 
And the uh, third time we tried it, the social worker thought maybe that it, maybe it was my delivery that was um, the problem. And so she offered to deliver it, also failed. So we've got, you know, this didn't work at all. And um, one of the people I was working with was a, a wonderful woman, one of my favorite people in the world, an older woman from the community. And she said, honey, it's just not gonna work. And I go, why not? She said, well, I don't know how to tell you. It's just not gonna work. And so she recommended that we get some community people together. Um, which we did. We had some pastors, we had uh, some of our young moms and um, social worker, a variety of people from the community came together, probably 10 of us, and we were around the table. And I posed the question, you know, this is so important that discipline is a big issue and we're trying to help with this. I thought it was arrogant. And um, they were very polite. And then finally, the pediatrician at the end of the table, who I didn't really know, um, but she'd been a black pediatrician. She'd been raised on a Delta herself. And she just kind of looked at me and she wasn't unkind really, but she said, um, you honkies just don't get it, do you? I was like, did you just call me honky? <laughs> but, um, and she, but she was absolutely right. It was like, you're right. I don't get it. Can you help me understand? And she and the group then began to explain why the intervention that worked in middle-class America was never going to work on the Delta, in the Deep South, in the Black population. It just wasn't going to work. And the more they explained, and I would never have been able to interpret that myself. I would have gone to my grave thinking that, you know, I, I did the right thing, somehow they had the problem. And actually, there was no way that a white woman from up North was going to understand that uh, Black experience in the Deep South. And so that's, it, just an illustration that I wanted to share about how powerful that community participation is in helping to interpret results in the community. Okay, next slide. Okay, the members of our group included faculty from nursing, social work, and counselor education, um, a pediatrician, we have a child psychiatrist, we have a representative from drug court, the community activist. We have a mental health provider, more than one. We have a kindergarten teacher, and we have another pediatric nurse practitioner who has since resigned. We had a number of members with lived experience, children who had been raised, or adults who had been children raised in homes uh, with um, addiction, people with a personal history of addiction, and adult caregivers of children. And that was another community of concern or population of concern was caregivers who step in to take care of these kids and what kind of support do they have. There's co-parents, there's step-parents, there's grandparents, other relatives. Okay, next slide. And um, the power of the partnership, I've already said, how, how powerful that is, that the community members bring wisdom and experience, and uh, the university brings uh, some academic and scholarly expertise. But these aren't mutually exclusive characteristics. And I should have mentioned that on the previous slide, too, that uh, many of our what we would call professional members actually have lived experience. And many of our people with lived experience actually are very academically qualified and are well educated. So there's, these are not mutually exclusive categories at all. You can go to the next slide. And uh, our initial exploration, our, our question about this issue was, is this, is this really a big problem? And I'm not gonna go through this in detail at all, um, but it, it, the answer to our question was, yeah, it absolutely is a problem that one in eight children live in a home affected by substance abuse. And that number is pretty accurate for Rochester as well as you can see the Minnesota stu uh, student survey, it's, it's uh, very similar. Um, and in Olmstead County, 41% uh, of out-of-home placements of children, children going into foster care, are because of uh, parent uh, substance abuse. Next slide. Okay, and so we explored the problem pretty thoroughly. Um, the only thing I want to say about this slide here is uh, the bullet there about um, children raised in families with substance use disorder are at increased risk for developmental, emotional, academic, and behavioral problems. And they're at very high risk of becoming uh, struggling with substance abuse themselves as they get older. And what I don't like about this is it's so clinical and so detached. And it's, it, it's all true. It's absolutely true. And it's reported in a kind of a scholarly way. But the lived experience for these children is so different. 
okay, it's the two-year-old who can't wake up mommy and is hungry, but mommy's passed out and can't get mommy to wake up. It's the three-year-old who watched his daddy, um, who's acting strangely, be taken away by the police in handcuffs. It's the five-year-old watching mommy who can't wake up being taken away on a stretcher. It's the seven-year-old who's in the D.A.R.E. in school and the D.A.R.E. officer is talking about how bad drugs are and this kid is realizing, oh my God, this is my family that he's talking about. So the lived experience for these kids, the chaos, the anxiety, the fear, the anger, the, um, the sadness, the chaos are very real for these kids. And it's not really captured when you use terms like emotional, academic, and substance use problems. It's, it's uh, the lived experiences is, is untidy at best. Next slide. Um, substance abuse disrupts a lot of aspects of family functioning, and we can just go right on. This shame, secrecy, desperation, isolation, um, etc. And um, we can go on to the next slide if we want. And um, the impact on um, and other, the adults who step in to take care of these kids is significant as well. And we can go to the next slide. Um, and what's interesting on this slide is that for every child in foster care being raised by a relative, there are 20 children who are being raised by relatives outside of the foster care system, people who are doing this on their own. And there's significant problems associated with that. Um, if you're taking care of your grandchild or your niece or nephew, you don't have legal custody and therefore you can't necessarily get the medical care and you can't communicate with the school because there hasn't been permission. Um, these are kids who have been through difficult experiences and they often act out. So raising these children is challenging. And so we wanted to better understand some of the, the needs of, of this population of caregivers as well. Next slide, please. And so we designed the first research study, phase one, was to uh, explore this problem from the perspective of um, professionals in the community who interact. And we wanted to find out from the professionals, uh, are they, how aware are they of the needs of children? Are they aware of how the needs of children change as a child matures? Uh, what resources do they have? What services do they provide? What resources are available for children in the community? And I'm not gonna say any more about this. Uh, the presentation in room three, at uh, 240 is going to go into detail on phase one of our research. And um, uh, Sonia Myers and Jessica Tai are gonna be presenting that. So we can go to the next slide. So phase one was the perception of key professionals. Phase two is going to be the um, talking directly or learning directly, listening directly to the voices of children who have been raised with substance abuse and the caregivers who step in to take care of these children. And phase three, based on the information we get from phase one and two, will be the development of interventions and the evaluation of interventions, uh, recommendations and policy uh, to support children and caregivers and developing curricular material for professional students who will be interacting with these families. Next slide. Um, around this time, we had an opportunity to transition to a nonprofit corporation. Uh, before, we'd just been kind of an informal group that came together, but the nonprofit that had been operating the free clinic, Mayo took over the free clinic at the ALC, at the Alternative Learning Center. And so that nonprofit, we had an opportunity to kind of adopt that nonprofit, which we did. And so we repurposed uh, the, that nonprofit and we developed a new mission and vision, which are on the screen there, inspiring the vision, hope, the vision, the vision is inspiring hope, healing, and health in all families. And our mission was to create and sustain compassionate community pathways to family recovery by creating dynamic partnerships, conducting relevant research, developing and evaluating resources, and advocate for data-driven policies in education. Okay, next slide. And this broadened our perspective quite a bit. And this is just a... Uh, uh, a picture of our organizational chart, which we don't need to deal with in detail, but at the top is the board of directors. There's a coordinating committee. On the right-hand side of the screen are standing committees, of which we have several, and they serve to support the organization. On the left-hand side of the screen are the community work groups. And um, as the more we've been in the community talking with people, the more um, issues have been brought to our attention and opportunities for us to participate. 
And right in the middle of the uh, our organizational chart is the research box, uh, because that's going to be important in all of our endeavors is to uh, bring scientific rigor and academic expertise and scholarship to the, issue, the situations that we're dealing with. If we can go to the next slide. So some of those boxes, harm reduction is one, and um, uh, these are strategies aimed at reducing the negative consequences and preventing complications associated with drug use. Uh, Dr. Moore and another uh, WSU faculty, Tara San Terry Sanneman from Nursing are heading up this project. It's a matter of meeting people where they're at. Um, it requires a non-judgmental, non-coercive uh, approach, and um, it involves things like needle exchange. Uh, for people who inject drugs, um, use of dirty needles will lead to a number of problems, abscesses, hepatitis, uh, HIV, um, cardiac um, endocarditis, um, all kinds of things. And uh, by using safe needles, we can't, not necessarily curing the addiction, but it is preventing complications for people um, who have addiction and, and um, prevents other health problems. Um, there's an opportunity to screen for HIV, hepatitis C virus, other infectious diseases. Testing for fentanyl is really important because some of the drugs on the street now have an unknown uh, amount of fentanyl in them, and fentanyl is much stronger than the opiates uh, and oxy and heroin. And so if fentanyl is mixed in the drug and people don't know that, and then it um, leads to some of the overdose. Narcan is the medication that you use to reverse overdose. We've done Narcan training. Um, but maybe most importantly with, sub, with this harm reduction is the opportunity to form a relationship and to establish trust. So that when these, and to educate them about reducing risk and, um, so it's, there's a lot to go with um, harm reduction. Some people will consider, I used to be one of those people that used to think that harm reduction, uh, needle exchanges, for example, was just supporting the habit. It was giving, almost giving them permission, giving them the needle to use, and I thought that's stupid. And, but now I realize, no, it's not. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of evidence supporting the effectiveness of this. And from the community perspective, it's important too, because what, what happens to use needles? You know, they're in the playgrounds and in the parks and um, along the side of the road. And uh, so having a, an ability to take the dirty needles and supply new needles, sterile needles is an uh, important intervention. Okay, next slide. Um, support at youth groups. Uh, again, Dr. Moore has been involved with a group to um, try to develop support groups for adolescents. We don't have much for support groups as an al -Anon group that really isn't very well attended in town, or al I mean. And um, so working to try to find how do we find a, a setting and a structure that will bring kids uh, in for support. Next slide. Um, continuity of care is a huge issue. Um, six times more people died of drug overdose in 2016 than in 2000. Huge increase, alcohol-related deaths have doubled. 11% um, of people who need treatment, only 11% get treatment. And uh, youth who survived an over opioid overdose, only one third got treatment and less than one out of 54 actually got the recommended standard of care treatment of medication assisted treatment. Uh, so there's a big problem here. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. So we're working with uh, community members. Oh, I'm sorry, maybe go to the next slide. I think this got out of order here maybe. Yeah, okay. So we're working with the healthcare system. Uh, we've met with St. Mary's Hospital, both inpatient and uh, emergency room um, providers. We've met with Olmstead Medical Group and um, looking at trying to make sure that we use the opportunities. There aren't a lot of opportunities where the addict intersects with the healthcare system. And ER and uh, hospital and detox and jail are some of those. We want to make sure that we use those opportunities uh, to the fullest extent possible. And hospitals do an excellent job of taking care of the acute health care needs, but it's very difficult for them to, um, to respond to the chronic nature of this disease and for ongoing treatment for alcoholism. So we have on the one hand the acute care setting, which provides excellent care, and over here we have the treatment facilities, but there's a gap in between. And so we've been working with these groups looking at how can we try to fill that gap, that gap and ease that transition. A lot of people get lost in that um, 
get lost in that gap. And so we've been working with the hospitals around that and um, easing that transition to the community. And then next slide. Uh, we're developing resources for children and families. And then I'll just, we went, already went past the slide, the last project we're working on right now is the, um, um, the speaker series. We haven't really done a lot with that yet, but we do want to develop a speaker series to uh, around community education to increase compassion, decrease stigma, help people understand this disease. Um, and some of the myths that we have about this disease are, are not helpful. Um, we said things like they have to hit rock bottom or, you know, it's just like, really? We don't do that for other chronic diseases. Do we don't tell that to the cancer patient? Well, you have to, you know, if we hit rock bottom, then we'll treat you. We don't do that for other diseases. And yet that's a common myth around addiction. And, and we can do better as some of those statistics that I went over fairly quickly show us that we need to be doing better with um, this. And we need to be focusing not just on the addict, but on the children and the family members who are also impacted. And I think we're almost done. Is there one more slide? Yeah, I think of our organization. In some ways, we're kind of, uh, we're a small, we're underfunded and overworked <laughs> little organization. Uh, people talk about the um, big frog in a small pond. We're just the opposite. We're a small frog in a big pond. Um, but I think of us sort of like a pebble in the pond that what we've done is we've thrown our pebble in the pond. We've raised the question, we've started conversations, and we're beginning to see ripple effects. And uh, with that, I will end and see if there's any questions.